I want to see um, a way to kind of humanize um, the Mexican population and the immigration um, issue in American politics. Give it a face. Hungry people aren't only homeless. Hungry people exist in our neighborhoods. There are neighbors um, that food security is a real issue. If people aren't laughing at your dreams and they're not big enough. You know, so, so dream big, um, stay with your dream. Hello and welcome to University Beat. I'm Denise White. We are in the home stretch of the 2016 presidential race, a campaign most would agree has been like no other in recent memory. In large part, that's due to the unorthodox style of Republican Donald Trump. A USF political science student got an up-close look at the Trump campaign this past summer when she attended the GOP convention in Cleveland. Her name is Mariana Sanchez, and our Mark Schreiner talked with her both before and after the convention. It was, she says, a political awakening. On the surface, what made Mariana Sanchez Ramirez an unusual attendee at the celebration of Donald Trump's nomination was that the Mexican-born 22-year-old is a Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals recipient. I'm essentially an undocumented uh, student here in the U.S., so I'm residing here um, without any uh, paperwork. So what this allows me to do is uh, this protection from uh, President Obama, which was granted in 2012, allows me to have a two-year work permit and actually, um, you know, work and go to school without, you know, the fear of being deported. Before she left for Cleveland, Sanchez Ramirez said that she was hoping to be a walking rebuttal to some of the candidates' statements about Mexican immigrants. I feel that Donald Trump does have his point of view, but I feel that the whole platform, the whole Republican Party doesn't necessarily have that perspective. So I want to see um, a way to kind of humanize um, the Mexican population and the immigration um, issue in American politics, give it a face. So I'm a student from a Mexican background. I'm not a rapist, I'm not a criminal. So but she wasn't there to protest. Kind of she was one of a hundred students invited to study and work through a program of the Washington Center for Internships and Academic Seminars. I felt that I needed to make a goal and try to attend one of these conventions to kind of get a better understanding, not just for theoretical purposes, like we learn in the classroom, actually apply what we learn in the classroom. So I feel that with this experience, I'll be able to kind of put my foot in the door in the realm of politics. During the convention, Sanchez Ramirez worked for the Hispanic TV network Univision. Her biggest concern was her safety, both because of the protesters and also being a Mexican Latino woman trying to enter the arena. It's just a little scary with the tone that's, that this convention has taken in regards to immigration and just immigrants in general. While Ramirez didn't agree with Trump's ideas, she welcomed the chance to interact with his supporters and maybe even change their minds. It's for example, I had a room, my roommate she would, uh, she would ask me, she was like, why are you so bothered by the fact that we call them illegal immigrants? Like, what's, what's the difference? I'm like, there's a big difference. No human being is legal. They're undocumented. They're just, unfortunately, don't have the papers to be legally in this country. She was like, I never really, you know, understood that. And I'm glad you were able to explain that to me. I'll no longer use this word. At the same time, Sanchez Ramirez says she came to some realizations about her own feelings for conservative voters. Once I talked to these students, especially, I was like, there's hope in our future regarding politics because I'm like, they're open to at least listening to another point of view and kind of taking that into consideration. And beyond the political spectrum, the encouragement she got from the people she worked with at Univision is prompting her to change her plans for the future. And they were like, you can do, if you want to truly be in the news industry, in the news media industry, you have the capabilities to do so. So just having that reassurance from a media organization that I only, you know, helped for four days, that says a lot. So I look forward to, you know, exploring the media industry and politics more. For University Beat, I'm Mark Schreiner. The presidential campaign returned to USF this month. Democrat Hillary Clinton spoke to about 1,500 people at the Tampa Campus Recreation Center on September 6. 
She called this year's election one of the most important of our lifetimes. Republican Donald Trump was at USF back in February, before he became the GOP nominee. And it is possible one or both of them may return before November, given the recognized importance of the I-4 corridor. To help us make some sense of this year's presidential race, a rather tall order, we're joined by USF political science professor, Dr. Susan McManus, and welcome to University Beat. Thanks, nice to be here. Oh boy, what an election year, okay. right? You know, we have seen, of course, Donald Trump politically come out of nowhere. He has run a very unconventional campaign, both he and Democrat Hillary Clinton have unusually high, unfavorable ratings. A couple of recent polls show the race is a dead heat. You know, from your perspective, 50 years from now, what will political scientists make of this election? It won't even take 50 years. We're going to have to rewrite all of the political science textbooks right now as to how you campaign and how you energize people and get them interested. What is the one thing that you take away from this that, that is a surprise to you? the impact of reality television and really technological advancements how we communicate with people has changed people just don't get news about politics in the same way they used to of course the i4 corridor in florida that's what's really going to decide which way florida is going to go would you say that's oh, still absolutely. the case absolutely because the tampa end of the i4 corridor houses 25 percent of all of Florida's registered voters, 24, 25 percent. The other end, Orlando, 20 percent. So basically, 44 to 45 percent of all Florida's 12 point something million registered voters live in these two media markets. And guess what? These two media markets are the most competitive. The percentage of Democrats and Republicans is almost equal, and the number of no party affiliations is actually a little bit higher than the state average. This is the battleground, the swing part of the swing state. Talk about the impact of the millennials in this election. Huge. Many people don't realize that this is now a large portion of our electorate. So many people have an idea that Florida is all retirees and the, the younger voters don't really matter. No longer true. If I take the millennials, the 18 to 34 year olds, plus the Gen Xers, the 35s to 50-ish, that is 49% of Florida's registered voters. No surprise that the candidates are hopping from one end of the I-4 corridor to the other and going where there are other universities. The millennial vote is the largest generation now and they are uh, less likely to register with a party. They're more likely to be independents. So they must be gone after. The future of Florida's two major parties, Democrats and Republicans, is really contingent upon reaching these younger voters who right now don't particularly like either party. What do you think the message is that the candidates have to use to resonate, resonate with voters in Florida? They must talk about two things. They absolutely have to talk about the economy. Even though we have recovered economically compared to other states, there's still a lot of people that are left behind. And every poll that I look at shows that there's still a significant portion of Florida who isn't where they need to be in terms of employment. The second issue is personal security and safety. And that really goes into two categories. Floridians want to hear about terrorism. How are you going to deal with that? How are you going to deal particularly with homegrown terrorism? We have 20 military installations here at McDill in our own backyard. But the second thing they're also looking at is personal safety for their family. These random shootings in places that you and I always thought were sacred, a home, a church. So, you know, the economy and terrorism and fear and safety are all the one, two, and that is nationally, and of course, it's true in Florida. How important will the debates be? Do you think that's an opportunity really to capture those independent voters who may still be sitting on the fence? I absolutely think the debates are going to be critical. Florida also has a history here. Many of our gubernatorial elections and a couple Senate races have been determined by debate performances. And Florida says, about 60% of Florida says that debates matter to them. So yes, they can make a big difference. We're expecting record turnout for the first debate. Do you think the Libertarian or the Green Party candidates will have an impact on the election? Oh, absolutely. Their numbers are going up because a lot of people are disenchanted with both of the major parties' nominees. Over 60% of Floridians have negatives about both Trump and Hillary Clinton. And particularly voters who are increasingly no party affiliation, which is our younger generations, they're looking at these minor parties as fresh faces and fresh ideas. 
So the degree to which they, their percentages increase, that takes away from Trump and Hillary, and that makes predictions all the more difficult. And if by chance one of them made it to the national debate stage, if they get the 15% in the polls that they need to, seeing one of these minor party candidates on the stage would totally change the dynamics of the election. Dr. Susan McManus, thank you so much for joining us. What a great place it is to be a political scientist. It certainly is, this is your year. <laughs> it is, so nice to be here, thank you for having me. Enrollment at USF Sarasota Manatee is at a new high, 2,071 students, an increase of 1.6% over last fall. What's behind the increase? Campus officials cite a couple of reasons. One factor is the continued popularity of the school's biology sequence. Another is the new Bridge to Engineering program, which allows students to start at Sarasota Manatee and later transfer to the College of Engineering on the Tampa campus. The average GPA for incoming freshmen at Sarasota Manatee this fall is 3.9, a significant increase over the past two years. For centuries, scientists have been trying to unlock the mysteries behind the power of lightning. Even Charles Darwin wrote about it. Now USF researchers are using a new approach to study lightning, not by looking up at the sky, but by looking down at the Florida sand and a small clue a lightning bolt can leave behind. In his own words, here's Dr. Matthew Pasek. What happens is the electricity hits that sand and heats it up really, really hot. We're talking 50,000 degrees Fahrenheit, hotter than anything we can see on the surface of the Earth, uh, hotter than the surface of the sun. So it heats it up, it vaporizes, completely vaporizes the rock and melts another portion of the rock. And that happens very fast and then it sits there and cools down forming a glass. And the glass that gets left over by the lightning is called a fulgurite. This fulgurite probably formed on the order of one one millionth of a second. So extremely fast time period to make a fulgurite. Um, it could have done so a thousand years ago, a million years ago, 10 days ago, um, yesterday, especially here in Florida where we have so much lightning. They are hollow because the interior is where the actual lightning was. So the lightning was traveling through the fulgurite and vaporized uh, the, the sand that was inside of it. Lightning, it turns out, has small amounts of energy and it can have really big amounts of energy. And so in the case of understanding how much energy there is, one of the ways of going about it is by looking at the fulgurites. And we can see how big the biggest lightning strikes actually are. Based on how thick they are, uh, how thick the fulgurite is, we can get an idea of how much energy each lightning strike actually gave to the ground. And so you can imagine that a bigger fulgurite means that there is more energy that got uh, put into the sand. A smaller one means that there was less. We still don't exactly know why lightning strikes. And so this may not help too much with understanding that, but it does give us uh, another idea of how much energy and maybe power a lightning strike might have. An assistant professor from USF's College of Education is in England as one of the first Fulbright scholars in cybersecurity. We spoke with Dr. Nathan Fisk, who studies instructional technology shortly before he left for the London School of Economics last month. Fisk will work with British investigators on a study called Preparing for a Digital Future. And my work specifically will be to uh, try to connect cybersecurity issues into that project, looking more carefully at how parents are thinking about cybersecurity, how they're preparing their children for a safer or less safe digital world, and how kids and parents are both thinking about uh, cybersecurity careers as a potential avenue for the future. Fisk says he's looking forward to comparing American procedures with how the UK handles its cybersecurity issues. If there's one thing that we already know in terms of cybersecurity, it's that if you're the one who designed a system, you don't have the perspective that you need to break into it. You don't know what those vulnerabilities will be. And so if we start there, then fundamentally cybersecurity should be a highly diverse workplace because we want those different perspectives coming in and providing different understandings of a system. And that'll help us better understand uh, what uh, the vulnerabilities are. Fisk will be overseas uh, for a year. Sure he hopes to bring back ideas that he can use to encourage USF students to pursue cybersecurity careers. 
The Moomaw College of Business has begun designing high-tech boot camps aimed at closing a skills gap in the computer workforce. The month-long camps will target disadvantaged young adults who have the aptitude but not the training in computer coding and apps, systems, and software development. The nearly $4 million initiative will also help with job placement. It's a, it's a White House um, promoted initiative which has the objective that we should train our domestic uh, young adults in such a way that they can replace those jobs which are technology intensive jobs which are now being taken up by foreign workers because there are not adequate number of such workers with these skills available in the domestic market. The camps will start next May and continue each summer for three years. According to the organization Feeding America, one in seven Americans struggles to eat enough every day. It's an issue in virtually every community. Students from USF School of Anthropology and College of Public Health are studying the problem. They're working with the group Feeding Tampa Bay. One of the areas they're focusing on is the phenomenon known as food insecurity. You can be food insecure and hungry but if you're hungry, that's actually the physical discomfort of not having enough food to eat. Um, with being food insecure, you may have food to eat, but it's the quality of the food that is uh, at question. Hungry people aren't only homeless. Hungry people exist in our neighborhoods. There are neighbors um, that food security is a real issue. We, we have this stereotype of what we think it means or what food insecure people or like or who they are and what we're discovering is that it can affect everyone so you know since the great recession of 2008 um, a much larger number of working uh, families are food insecure seniors can be food insecure children could be food insecure even college students at USF can be food insecure Food security um, deals with issues of if people can buy the kinds of food that they need to eat um, when they want to buy it. So we've heard a lot from folks that the end of the month is a particularly difficult time for them to afford food. Um, and so food security is really about can you buy the fruits and vegetables? Maybe you're diabetic and you can't get ha afford the kind of diet that your doctor has suggested to help control diabetes um, or any other kinds of health conditions. If you look at the data from 2007, 2008, when the recession really begins to kick in, the number of food insecure households increases dramatically. And it reaches a peak at just under 15% uh, in 2009, 2010. But it hasn't really come down significantly, uh, even though the economy is improving. And uh, we really think a lot of that has to do with the fact that the cost of living has gone up but wages aren't keeping pace with that. So we're seeing a lot more families now who were considered middle income who are food insecure now. The data for the state of Florida is even higher, it's 17%. Um, and in Hillsborough County, it's about 16%. So we're above the national average, and this is really why it's, a, I think, a very pressing issue uh, in Tampa Bay. We have the backpack program, the mobile pantry program, uh, which is what we're out here doing today. Um, and, and the idea really is just to, to perform research on the food that we're providing, uh, the situations that the families that we're serving are in, um, just to gather more data so that we can be more impactful with the programs that we have. The results of the backpack program uh, were actually quite uh, interesting. We found, for example, that about 60% of the, the adults um, um, found that it really was, it, it, was an, it, it improved the situation in the household and for their kids. Um, and we also found that um, the food actually gets spread throughout the household. So some of the kids would talk to us about, well, there were some leftovers and my mom took it to work on Monday. Or when I came home from school on Friday afternoon and there was nothing to eat, I had something in my backpack. The kids said it did make them feel uh, happier and that they were more ready to, uh, to go to school on Monday, uh, more excited about school. I think it's a wonderful thing. There's a lot of people who 
don't have the ability or the uh, availability to be able to get out and sometimes and get the food that they need and it's wonderful that people are able to do this and, and get food sometimes it's all they get I think it's great but it's more than just providing food we have to provide health we have to provide better outcomes for these families and so um, the, the research that we're performing it's it's allowing us to truly address the issue of hunger and food insecurity by really getting to the nature of the problem of it, getting a better understanding of what's going on. Um, that way we can move forward and, and create better programs and create much more impact in the community. It is sometimes uncomfortable. I like to be at the other end giving it, most definitely. It's quite a feeling. But to be on the other end where I'm receiving it, I just have to remind myself that we all get to that place at some point where we just need to receive you know receive people's love and you know we, we have a time and place for everything this week in usf history lambda chi alpha became the first greek organization on the usf campus in september of 1967 but the fraternity's national office shut down the usf chapter in 2006 citing alcohol and hazing violations USF's football team has opened the 2016 season with a pair of wins. The Bulls defeated Towson State 56-20 in the first game and then beat Northern Illinois 48-17. But the going likely is going to get tougher. After traveling to Syracuse for game number three, the Bulls return home September 24th to take on the Florida State Seminoles. Being a head football coach is one of those jobs where you spend a lot of time looking ahead. What's the next play? How do you prepare for the next opponent? Who's your next big recruit? But in the case of USF's Willie Taggart, he's also found time to look back and give back to his hometown. Hedel Gandhi explains. Here we go. Go Bulls on three. One, two, three. Jalen Wester may only be 12 years old, but he's here to practice like a pro. I've been doing a hitting drill, and I've been doing a throwing to help my arm. Jalen and hundreds of other kids lined up for this free summer football camp at Lincoln Park in Palmetto. It was a chance to train with USF Bulls head coach Willie Taggart. It's very cool. Usually you see him on TV and stuff, and it's cool to actually see him in person. And while Taggart's star power might be the draw for many in this community, it's the community that inspired Taggart to host this camp. I look at the success that I've had, and to be able to come back, be able to point across the street where a lot of these kids walk around and they see and, and let them know I grew up right here. I was just like them, you know, and work hard. Uh, did the things I needed to do in order to be successful. And just a stone's throw away from Lincoln Park is this Palmetto home where Coach Taggart grew up. It was in this very backyard where he himself used to practice football. I think it's very passionate of him and good because to come back to your roots, that's very nice because some people just forget about where they come from. And that's very good that he made a camp because it's like $300 camps out there that people don't get to go to. And it's a very small town, so that was very nice of him. The coach teaches these kids the fundamentals of football through drills and obstacle courses. But he also knows the real-life obstacles they face each and every day. Hey, hey, you don't have to be in a hurry. You want to do it the right way, okay? Well, I'm, I'm a big believer that you got to take care of yourself. You know what I mean? Each individual got to take care of themselves. It's, it's their lives. You can't depend on anyone else, you know. For you. you can't blame anyone for you not being successful. You know, that's, that's been my motto the whole time, not to blame anyone, not to make any excuses. It's that philosophy that's brought Taggart the type of success that's made him a role model in this community. It's, it's awesome. You know, like they say, it takes a village to raise a child. And sometimes, even as a father and son relationship, that's good. But to have other elements like this program and coaches to input sports and other life skills into his life. It's, it's just a, a great thing, so I'm just honored to be a part of it. Dante's son is leaving camp with big dreams for the future. Hopefully just get into a league and do the best I can and get to the NFL one day. And whether their aspirations are on or off the football field, Coach Taggart's message, anything is possible. If people aren't laughing at your dreams, then they're not big enough. You know, so, so dream big, 
Um, stay with your dream. And I tell you, I'm still dreaming. I don't want to wake up. I'm still dreaming. I'm living the life that I want to live. For University Beat, I'm Hedel Gandhi. If you have a story about the University of South Florida you'd like to see us cover, we'd love to hear from you. Our email is ubeat at wusf.org, and our website is universitybeattv.org. You can also reach us via Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram by searching University Beat TV. And there's a new way to contact us via the WUSF app. Just download it and write University Beat in the subject line. That's our show for this week. I'm Denise White. Thank you so much for joining us.